We have our chair, uh, Anna Tukatia from Fiji, who due to uh, visa issues can't join us, and this is why my colleague Professor Catherine Irons is going to step in. But Anna has sent us a message from Fiji this morning, and, th and so setting up, I think, this conference to, in parts very nicely. And so we're going to start the session with showing her message to us, and then Cathy will take over. Bulavinaka from exotic paradise here in Suva, Fiji. And I give you warm greetings. I want to show you my office for the day. So I'm here at the Grand Pacific Hotel that was built in 1914. And not only that, it's also fitting for today's topic on alternative dispute resolutions and small island states. Now, Fiji, like a lot of other Pacific Islanders, and islands rely on the tourism sector. Um, more than 74% of its foreign earnings in Fiji are gained from tourism. And hotels such as the one that's in the background, uh, foreign owned or actually foreign companies and international commercial industries either co-own it or co-share ownership with the land owning units that are here or that own it with government and have different arrangements in terms of the way it's built. Most of the tourism sector in the Pacific or the tourism um, stakeholders are actually owned by foreigners or foreign international companies, which gives us the biggest risk in the Pacific of future international disputes. And today's topic is really very, very appropriate when it comes to Pacific Island countries such as Fiji, the Cook Islands, Samoa and Tonga. Most of these islands uh, and countries are actually in the process of passing legislation that encourages alternative uh, dispute resolution when it comes to international uh, disputes, international commercial disputes. And some of these countries need a push of legislation to encourage lawyers and practitioners another uh, way of resolving. Now here in Fiji we just go to court and it's a common practice around the Pacific and court is just directly opposite this building uh, for us here in Suva. Let's go there. This is the court here in Suva, Fiji that houses the four different courts which is the Supreme Court, uh, Court of Appeal, High Court and the Magistrates Court. Uh, most of the environmental issues that are brought before the civil court, uh, apart from the criminal court that deals with fraud and other criminal avenues, um, civil court mainly deals with title ownership. Uh, that is who actually owns and who's responsible for what in terms of the uh, international contract. Uh, they also deal with the contracts itself, delays because of good governance issues, or environmental assessment issues or climate change issues. Uh, as you know, uh, Fiji, like any other Pacific Island country, it is a developing country. So we actually import, so whether the contractors are contracted, they import uh, materials uh, from Asia or from Europe. And issues of delay is quite common here. In addition to that, other issues uh, that they face is the parties that are involved or subcontractors. Uh, so these are the issues that are brought here before the court. Uh, court cases can last from five years to 25 years. Uh, so most of the Pacific Island countries, even law practitioners, will be keen to see the outcome of the seminar that we will be discussing and the topics that we will be deliberating on for the next two days because we need to find alternative dispute resolution to solve not only environmental issues, but contractual issues that involve foreign governor, uh, governments, also foreign investors and foreign contractors or subcontractors. Uh, this is a, a keen topic and we're all excited in the Pacific to see what are the suggestions in terms of alternative dispute resolutions? What system should we face? Now we're still awaiting the procedures for this and should Fiji also um, in, embrace uh, the alternative of a new uh, environmental um, dispute resolution uh, tribunal or what else is the alternative? And is it practical or does one solution fits all? 
or should we adopt different uh, approaches that are, um, have been approached by different uh, countries. So we are excited to see the outcome and I wish you all the best. Um, so we won't take questions right now. What I have um, the privilege of introducing next is we have another um, hour and a half for four more speakers and question time for all five. So what I um, uh, I just like we, what we've got on. on they're all described, the speakers and their topics are described in your program, so I'm just going um, to list them. Well, I think they're, again, I'm just stepping in, but I gather the arrangement is we'll have the four speakers for 15 minutes each, um, and then that still leaves us half an hour for the discussion and the questions. Um, so we have um, Stuart Bruce on corporate governance and environment. We have Monica Ferriatinta um, on um, international dispute resolution for climate change. We have Dr. Ursula Tott um, on enforcement of awards and small states' interests. And then um, um, Dr. Alejandra Torres. Um, and so uh, I guess I'll first um, call, we'll call them up one at a time. Um, and given what we've had with the visuals, we'll maybe just come up and then come back down. But then all four or maybe five will come up at the end. Um, so first, Stuart Bruce. Um, please. I presume Stuart's in the... There we go. Thank you very much. Do you have a choice of standing or sitting? I think I'll stay sitting. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for your, for your attendance here today. Um, I'm going to speak about developments in corporate governance and climate risks and disputes. I'm actually going to qu cover quite a bit of, uh, quite a few topics in the next 20 minutes. So I will time myself and hopefully not go over. Um, but the purpose of, of being so broad today is really that I want to bring your attention to a lot of developments and a lot of initiatives out there at the moment, rather than go into great detail into each one. Um, I think it's relevant because you may wish to go home and explore this further with your governments, with your ministers, with your regulators, with your law firms, um, and extend upon these ideas in the future. So, in recent years, there has been a dramatic increase in domestic and transnational disputes that involve climate change and climate-related aspects, but also an increase in, in public regulation and private initiatives in relation to, the, in relation to transparency, to corporate governance, um, and business reporting in relation to climate risks. And why is this happening? Well, in my view, there are a number of reasons why this is occurring. Principally, it's a response to the growing awareness of the susceptibility and risks um, of climate change to society, to humanity, and in particular to small states who historically um, suffer the, the disproportionate burden of climate change, or they've, they've contributed little to it. It's also in relation to the growing awareness of a risk, a growing risk at a corporate level on non-disclosure, misrepresentation issues, and potential liability for things like stranded ass assets um, and contribution to climate change. And it's also because, on another level, <clears throat> organisations and people have a genuine interest in holding themselves out to a higher standard. And I think that's a really important aspiration. And a lot of the initiatives I'll talk about today uh, are deliberately frame, framed in aspirational terms to try and encourage corporations in particular to be better corporate citizens. Um, so standard setting is really important. And the initiatives I'll talk about are all about improving and increasing the standards that corporations are held to. Um, and naturally, that will flow into disputes in the future in some respects um, through mandatory initiatives, but also voluntary initiatives can take a life of their own and become incorporated into contracts and therefore have some kind of legal teeth as well. So firstly, what are some initiatives out there? I'm going to look at the United States. There are two sort of strands of interesting developments in the United States, or well, a few more, but two that I'll discuss today. One is the Attorney Generals of various states who are bringing proceedings against Exxon. Um, the Attorney Generals of New York, Massachusetts, and the US Virgin Islands have all commenced investigations in Mr. Ex Exxon and, and are seeking to subpoena 40 years worth of documents from Exxon. The basic thrust of the investigation 
is that they say that Exxon is likely to have misled the public about the risks of climate change and misled their investors about those risks and also therefore by quality the value of their assets um, and that Exxon knew about this. They had internal documents and science and knowledge um, showing that they knew of the risks of climate change but didn't reveal those risks and in some instances perhaps, ac perhaps actually um, work towards suppressing the, that knowledge. So in a sense, this is sort of like the big tobacco litigation of the 80s, um, but it's climate change and it's the oil majors. Um, the basis of claims is very interesting and they differ quite a lot, so bear this in mind when you go home. In the subpoena for, the New, for New York, um, the allegations there relate to fraud and illegality, um, deceptive acts um, and, poss and possible breaches of listing obligations and obligations in respect of stocks and bonds and other types of securities. Um, in the Massachusetts um, in, uh, investigation, it's based on consumer protection law and, and, and statutes. And here it's in relation to the marketing and or sale of energy and other fossil fuels derived from, uh, derived, fossil fuel derived products for consumers um, or the marketing or sale of securities um, in relation to those types of products, so in, its, in the company itself. Um, and in the Virgin Islands, there's uh, the, the basis was in relation to corruption and, interestingly, obtaining money by false pretense. Um, so there are sort of three or four very different causes of action there which the Attorney Generals have pursued to, to commence their investigation against Exxon. Um, and they're all seeking very large disclosure of documents. Um, and, of course, Exxon is resisting quite a lot. Um, but it's early days for some of those cases. We'll see where they go. The Virgin Islands have actually withdrawn their subpoena um, that Massachusetts and New York continue. Another strand of uh, cases is cities in the states suing oil majors. And in this instance, they're in particular San Francisco and Oakland, uh, and more recently, uh, Rhode Island, I believe two months ago. The companies being sued here are Chevron, Exxon, ConocoPhillips, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, and BP. And in this situation, the, the cities are claiming that the companies knew of the risks, and they knew that the risk of the products that they were creating and selling to the public and didn't tell the public. Um, effectively, they're bringing a public nuisance claim here. Um, uh, for promotion of the sale and use of, of, of fossil fuels since the 50s, knowing that the public would rely on the information that they gave to them um, uh, and to the detriment of the public at large and also shareholders, etc. cetera. Um, here, the, the cities are focusing more on the physical impacts of the climate change in relation to the remedies that they are seeking. Uh, and they're seeking contribution of funds for things like reclamation of lands damaged by climate change, so seawalls, erosion of beaches, of territories, um, damage to crops, these types of things, but in particular in relation to the coastal aspects, uh, which obviously affects small states as well. Um, now, Exxon has defended this and has sought to kick the proceedings from a state level to the federal level, where it might have a, a greater chance of success, and indeed it did have a, uh, it did prevail in the federal court, um, and the case against the Fra San Francisco and Oakland has been dismissed for the moment. But in that in the federal court, the judge acknowledged um, that there are very real dangers of climate change, and that the fossil fuel majors didn't necessarily deny this, but that the type of issue they were bringing wasn't suitable for determination in the federal court. Uh, it was better for Congress. So there you go, some interesting developments in the United States, different causes of action which your states at home might have uh, and might be able to use in an innovative ma manner, manner as well to the extent you wish to um, think about bringing proceedings against somebody. Um, <laughs> a natural extension to this in a slightly different context though is a climate change and human rights claim. Uh, in 2015, Greenpeace um, and communities in the Philippines filed a petition with the Philippines Human Rights Commission, which is a constitutional body, uh, in relation to the effects on human rights, the right to life, right to a clean environment, right to, to safety, uh, those effects by climate change. Um, and it's a natural extension, if you like, from the non-disclosure of climate risks in, in America. Those risks also play into human rights issues. Um, in this situation, 47 investors, uh, investor-owned companies, have been named as the defendants, um, many of whom are not participating, um, but many of whom have actually been asked to participate and get more involved. The hearing started just only recently. They'll go for another year, uh, but it's a very, very significant um, development in this space. And while it's not um, 
an adjudicative setting, uh, it is effectively a fact-finding setting, um, and one of the requests is that the, the factual analysis and the outcomes derived from the commission are relied upon by the government and acted upon by the government. Um, in that case, what's really interesting is that they've relied very heavily on scientific evidence. An expert has put in a report um, totaling the carbon emissions since 1751 globally and has effectively attributed about 21% of those emissions to the 47 named defendants uh, and therefore seeking some kind of um, um, remedy in proportion to their contribution. Um, so that's not really interesting development. Okay, moving a bit closer to home soil for us at the moment, in England, in 2015, uh, the Bank of England produced a report on the, the risks and impacts of climate change on the insurance industry. Now, the insurance industry has actually been really progressive in the climate change space, but they need to be, because their long-term horizon is 30, 40, 50 years. So they're thinking right down the track, and what's the world gonna look like then, and how do I get premiums in the door? What are the claims gonna be uh, likely to be? Um, and uh, this, this report, which, is, which was released, um, really made quite, quite a few waves, not just in the insurance industry, although it was targeted on the insurance sector. Basically, the report is trying to provide a risk, an early risk assessment framework for insurance companies in relation to their products uh, in relation to climate, climate change. Um, and the bank focused on three particular uh, risks, physical risks, so weather-related events affecting your, your products, your property, your damage, uh, and damaging your property, transitional risks, so the risks involved in a transition from a carbon-intensive world to a low-carbon world, and in particular here, the repricing of, uh, of commodity prices, but also the, the asset base of companies. So again, heading to the stranded asset territory, of which there's been a lot of discussion coming out of organisations, um, uh, including, including Oxford. Um, another category was the liability risk. So the, the risk of <clears throat> other parties seeking or bringing claims against insurance companies uh, or advisors who have, who have insurance for all these transition risks and, and physical risks. Um, I'll stop there with that report. It's, it was very, very influential um, a couple of years ago and it continues to be influential and it's really helped, it's really advanced the conversation in the insurance companies um, in the sector. Um, more recently, in August this year, and very related to that, um, a complaint was made against three insurance companies in the United States, uh, in the UK, beg your pardon. Um, a complaint was made to the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, saying that these companies had not disclosed the climate risks in their annual reports, and they should have done so. Um, Client Earth is the name of the NGO uh, who, who made those complaints, and I think they might be in the audience today or over the course of the next couple of days. Um, and a legal basis was founded on a combination of non-compliance with the EU transparency directive and various transposed obligations into the UK law. Um, um, and the remedies they're seeking here is a financial pe penalty, mandatory publishing of climate data um, uh, in their annual reports. So that was a really quick gallop through some, some, some developments out there, some disputes which are very real, very live, um, and provide, in a sense, a bit of a toolkit from a legal, um, legal claims basis, but also from a creativity thinking basis on which you could pursue uh, at home or discuss with other people. Um, I'm now gonna move into some initiatives out there at the moment, particularly voluntary initiatives uh, that we can encourage companies to sign up to and adhere to uh, in relation to climate disclosure and climate risks, but also more broadly, to encourage companies to be better corporate citizens. Um, the, most, the most recent one, is actually the recommendations that came out of the Financial Stability Board Task Force on Climate Change last year. So that was another big report um, about the risks of uh, finan fi financial disclosure um, in the context of climate change. Uh, what's really remarkable here is that the, the, the task force was backed by, it was basically requested by the G20 and it has the imprimatur of the Bank of International Settlements, so it will have a lot of sway. Even though it's non-binding, uh, it will effectively, I suspect, be used as a code of best practices for organisations. What it seeks to do, basically, is act as a meta framework, because there are currently a lot of initiatives out there, voluntary initiatives, to account for carbon disclosure, greenhouse gas disclosures and emissions. 
it sort of sits above these in a sense and says that the, at the company level, here are the things you should be thinking about, the things you should be doing to report and disclose on your, your climate um, emissions. And you could do so by using the various initiatives out there and also ensuring you have systems and processes in place, et cetera. Um, so it focused on four main areas, the governance of the organisation and how the board of directors and the senior executives attend to climate risks and whether uh, there are meetings and minutes going up to the board of directors and reports which, which relate to climate risks. Um, they talked about strategy and so how the company in determining its longer term and medium term strategies is factoring in climate change risks but also climate change opportunities as well. Um, because the reality is there's a lot of money to be made um, in, in dealing with uh, issues affected by climate change in the future, such as um, moving to more sustainable sources of energy. And if you're selling that, uh, that's great for business, great for you. They also looked at risk management as a whole and the processes by which a company identifies, assesses and monitors the risks uh, uh, and builds action plans around them. And then finally, uh, and quite obviously was a recommendation to build metrics and targets around this so you can actually monitor your progress over time and see how you're tracking. So that's kind of the meta framework uh, and there's a lot of details that's behind that of course um, that the task force has recommended. Now that was last year. Already in this year, in July in Australia, a, a young man, um, a 23 year old, brought a claim against his pension fund, his superannuation fund, for failing to disclose climate risks and the impact on their investments. And as a part of the remedy, actually requested that the, the insurance, so the pension fund, adhere to the recommendations of the task force. So that's a great example of a non-binding document already finding its way into litigation and having some kind of impact perhaps on the proceedings. Um, so there's no reason why that task force report and recommendation can also be used in your home jurisdiction uh, in, different, in different ways. All right, that's, that's, that's um, sorry, that's the first one. You've got four more to go. Hang in there. Um, <laughs> five minutes, all right. Okay, one minute per, per item. Here we go. Um, quickly then. The other initiatives are also voluntary, but they're going back a bit further in time. Firstly, the UN Global Compact. The UN Global Compact is, um, is, a, is, is, a, is a framework that applies to any company and it's basically encouraging that company to be a better corporate citizen uh, in, the, in the field of labor, labor rights, human rights, and environmental issues. Uh, and in the environment space, in fact, there are three principles which it articulates. One, it encourages the company to adopt a precautionary approach to its activities, and we heard uh, Lord Carnworth discuss that a moment ago, um, to promote environmental responsibility in all of its operations and processes and its products, and to support environmentally friendly technologies. Um, the framework itself is not binding, but it sort of it was almost in a sense ground zero in, in some respects of the new wave of ESG reporting um, starting in 2000. Um, the equator principles, 2003. These apply to project financing, particularly in emerging, emerging markets and developing states. So the focus, the sector is different. It's very specific here, project financing, and in particular projects above $10 million. So here, this sets out a set of, set of principles, again, quite general principles and systemic principles, that encourages financial institutions in this space to adhere to. Um, it's basically about social and environmental risk due diligence of your projects to assess how it may impact those issues on the ground and how to, bring a, and how to develop plans to mitigate and manage and reduce the impacts of those projects. It doesn't have its own internal standards, um, but it, requ it requests that companies uh, and, and project sponsors adhere to World Bank and IFC standards, uh, environmental standards in these projects. Interestingly, there's a very real way in which this can become a legally binding obligation. The equator principles recommend that covenants, reps and warranties in contracts incorporate the terms of the equator principles. So here's an example of a non-binding document um, possibly having legal teeth. Uh, through incorporation in the contract law. All right, next is um, the UN principles of responsible investment, 2006. Here we're focusing on investment, investors, in institutional investors, big pension funds, hedge funds. Uh, it effectively asks them to be sensible and pursue an ESG agenda when considering the analysis going into investments, when making their investments, when being an investor and being on the being on the board and agitating for ESG. And when I say ESG, I mean environment, social and governance changes. Um, uh, 
um, and it, there's currently 1,700 signat signatories to this, this initiative. So it's investment focused um, and has become a flagship part of the UN sort of apparatus. Another one related is the principles on sustainable insurance, um, which do a similar thing, but in the insurance company, in the insurance sector in particular. Finally, I'll mention the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises 2011. Unlike the other voluntary initiatives I've discussed, all of which have a sort of reporting aspect and a compliance aspect, and but are non-binding, um, and don't have a dispute resolution aspect, the OECD guidelines do. They do have a dispute resolution process, so they're quite unique in that regard. And another way which they're differentiated is that they have, and they set out a very comprehensive set of standards which the companies who, are about, or who apply them are to adhere to. They also work a bit differently from a state endorsement perspective. It's the state which signs up to the OECD guidelines and then recommends that companies operating in its territory or jurisdiction um, adhere to those guidelines. So implement the standards that, that, that are recommended um, and account on how they're adhering to those standards over time and how they communicate those standards to their stakeholders, et cetera. And as I said, there's a dispute settlement aspect to it there. And one big chapter in there is about in the environment. So, uh, and it also includes climate, uh, sort of carbon risk, et cetera. So that's another example of a, of a voluntary initiative out there that all companies can participate in and should be participating in. So I've galloped through a lot of things here, but again, the idea was to give you some ideas of the things out there which you can think about further when you, when you go back to, to but go home, go to your law firm, whatever, um, because climate risk disclosure obligations and related aspects are a very real thing. Uh, we're in a different world now. 15, 20 years ago, CSR was a bit of a greenwash sort of thing, a bit of a PR campaign. Now things have changed. Consumers really care about this stuff now. So companies are taking it a whole lot more seriously. Um, and hopefully today I've canvassed a few ways in which they can. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so now, Monica Ferriatinta is going to continue this focus on dispute resolution and climate change and get into a little bit more of the detail, I gather. Thank you very much, Monica. Can you hear me clearly? Thank you. Um, I'm very thankful for the invitation. It's a real honor to be able to share some thoughts um, with you today. Um, I entitled um, my presentation, Melting Glaciers, Disappearing Estates and Endangered Populations, because um, this is really uh, how the level of what we are discussing, I mean, it is in some places quite extreme. Now. There are two corner principles that are foundational to environmental law. The principle that polluter pays and that the states have a duty to prevent transboundary harm. I'm, I'm going to um, focus uh, my presentation on issues of transboundary harm because um, this is particularly the scenario that we are thinking about when it comes to climate change. That is um, impacts that are happening far away from the place where all of this is being originated. Now, these uh, principles were referred to in a very old case in 1941. So imagine how many decades um, we have um, experienced since. So the question is, what has happened? Now, in the context of climate change and against that background, the fundamental question, uh, in my opinion, is can the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases be taken to account in international fora for the environmental damage these emissions are causing? Um, and perhaps I would say that the focus is, in my view, on legal consequences, shifting away from the issues that perhaps Philip Sands was discussing about some years ago uh, um, in terms of finding the opportunity to get a court to assert, a, assert, to assert facts. We, are, we have moved beyond that, and the paradigm seems to be legal consequences. Now, my presentation look at the current state of international dispute resolution to assert two things, whether climate change can be justiciable in international courts and tribunals, and second, explores the role 
if any, that uh, international law dispute resolution may have in preventing and remedying climate change harm. Now, I have five submissions to make um, in this respect. Number one, in my view, if in the past climate change harm was considered too distant and uncertain of being capable to be redressed by contentious dispute resolution, um, difficulties identified were, for example, that primary obligation and international law was not clear, problems of attribution, and establishing specific causality. Um, today, the notion of transboundary um, harm has experienced a revolution, and, and, and that is quite, um, quite new. Number two, domestic contentious cases, such as the Saul Yuya versus the, uh, RWE, dealing with causality, in the context of climate change, are likely to impact international dispute resolution. Three, contrary to the assumption uh, that international courts of limited jurisdiction, and this is something that Philip mentioned back then in his presentation, um, there was this idea that perhaps um, the, the breakthroughs were going to happen from uh, a court of white jurisdiction, such as the ICJ and not from courts of limited jurisdictions such as a human rights court. What has happened in actually is the opposite. We have experienced that um, um, courts, uh, human rights courts, for example, that at the time were thought unlikely to contribute in a material way to a broader response to climate change challenges, have come with, with very, to um, issue very interesting decisions. Now, the Inter-American system has been dealing with important climate change issues ranging from the plight of Inuits to, to the um, Athabascan black carbon case seeking Canada's reduction of soot emissions. But the most interesting and audacious um, uh, case has been the recent Inter-American Court on Human Rights Advisory Opinion on Environment and Human Rights, which dealt quite interestingly with the principle, the precautionary principle um, making, I would say, um, um, somehow um, creating a major, major change in the system in the way how you look at obligations of the states. For, in my view, the time may be ripe for climate change cases reaching the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, both in its advisory and contentious dispute resolution functions, with jurisdiction to interpret key provisions on the protection of the environment under UNCLOS and address issues such as ocean acidification, sea level rise, among others. The recent Ghana versus Cote d'Ivoire shows the willingness of ITLOS to deal with environmental protection. And five, whilst the possibility of an advisor opinion concerning the ICJ remains open, the probability of a dispute in the mavromatic sense of what a dispute is in the area of climate change is not unlikely. In such prospective disputes, it is to be expected that evidentiary issues are going to be key, drawing on from the whaling case that was referred to before, in which for the first time expert witnesses were cross-examined in the ICJ case and from the Costa Rica versus Nicaragua case in which the court developed important considerations of proof of damage and causation with respect to environmental damage and valuation of damage. Oops. Right, so let me go to the inter-American system first. This was uh, the first case on global warming that we had. Um, unfortunately, um, the case was not successful. Uh, and I must say that it was dismissed uh, on, on the basis, it simply was not dealt with. Um, the commission didn't even issue an admissibility decision. But what is interesting is that it's a very substantial claim. We, uh, if you analyze that, it's 175 pages of analysis of in what way the Inuits were affected by global warming. Um, some of the um, submissions uh, are copied there, and you can see that um, the United States um, was considered to be um, there the world largest uh, emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, the Inuits were alleging that their style of life and their entire livelihoods were obviously being destroyed. 
Um, and they made the point that nowhere on Earth has global warming had a more severe impact than the Arctic. Now, some of the evidence that they provide was scientific, including they, they took, a, um, they used uh, quite wisely the um, IPCC third assessment report to actually base um, their claim on. Now, they also wanted some remedies, and the remedies had um, some, uh, some of them were long-term and some of them were um, short-term remedies, which in my view would have included, for example, uh, measures of the sort that we were discussing in, in some of the workshops uh, that could just palliate for the, for the time being the consequences of what they were experiencing. Now, the case was dismissed. Um, this is a case uh, that is um, before um, some other developments happened in the American system. But nevertheless, it was a bold attempt. Um, the Iris could present the claim again because it was not dismissed on, on basis of admissibility. It was simply a, a, a formality issue. Um, and what the commission did after that was to invite them to um, participate in a, thema in a thematic session which dealt just with climate change. So uh, that's another function of the Inter-American Commission that has been used by indigenous peoples to bring um, the kind of issues they're concerned with. And now, um, there's a second case at present, and this is a very interesting case concerning Canada. Now, what is interesting about these cases is that we are having, it's, it's quite difficult, jurisdiction is a, a key topic here. And it's quite difficult from the point of view of, of a litigator to find jurisdiction sometimes to pin down the, the, the largest emitters. Um, now, the inter-American system is one of the few, if you want, systems that where you have the US being a, a party to a treaty with some kind of um, uh, follow-up system. Uh, the commission is not a court. Nevertheless, uh, it can hear individual petitions under the charter and, and under other um, treaties uh, concerning um, countries such as Canada or the United States. Um, so this particular case against Canada was filed in 2013 and it's ongoing. Now we have had in the meantime a new development which may have a bearing and influence the outcome of this particular case. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights released just in February 2018 a, a decision um, on environment and human rights that uh, clearly is uh, revolutionary in many senses. I have written a piece with a colleague, uh, Simon Mills, who was in some of the sessions yesterday, um, on this, um, and we analyze in what way um, this decision is um, bringing together environmental law and human rights law uh, in a single um, a vision uh, in terms of obligations for the first time. Now, what this advisory opinion did was to um, build um, a lot from a soft law, Rio Declaration, a Stockholm Declaration, and uh, understand environmental law in, in the context um, and being inter interconnected with human rights. So it gives for the first time a recognition of the right to, to healthy environments and how all human rights will be connected to that because you cannot live or have a... Uh, uh, the right to life or right to health uh, in a context where um, that is seriously threatened. Now, there is a um, reference to climate change there at paragraph 47. Um, and uh, that's interesting because um, it's for the first time the court refers uh, to climate change potentially as harmful or, uh, and as um, a violation of uh, the enjoyment of, of human rights. In what concerns uh, jurisdictional issues, particularly transboundary harm, I think that um, uh, paragraph 104H is quite important because uh, the court for the first time is given the possibility to actually bring cases um, against a state A, let's say, uh, by people in a state B for harm that has taken place in a state B. Uh, that is beyond what usually we would have assumed was the jurisdiction of, of, this, of the state of origin. Um, now, effective control has been obviously in the jurisprudence of many courts, but here um, it has taken a new um, uh, interpretation somehow because uh, it concerns uh, effective control over activities carried out that cause the harm and not um, 
uh, control over individuals or, or, or as, as, as it was in, in, in other cases, likely to be also an issue in, in the European system once um, the court faces a case where perhaps um, um, there are issues of environmental harm in such a context, in, in a transboundary context. But the Inter-American system clearly has um, interpreted its own jurisdiction in a way that uh, we will be seeing um, a lot of litigation in the future in this context, I would imagine. Oh, sorry. So, uh, the case uh, here is the um, domestic, it's a domestic case, uh, Saul Luciano Juja versus uh, RWE from the Oberlandes Gericht in Harm. The reason why I um, brought it up in this context is because um, this is a Peruvian farmer. This is a, a, exactly the context in which we are, we are wondering whether international law can be useful at all. It's a domestic case, but it's a domestic case that is developing important issues as to how to deal with evidence by a court in the context of climate change. Um, now, um, there was an order recently by the court uh, in February 2018, and you can see there a couple of um, paragraphs from that order. One of that had to do with the position, obviously, of the respondent that said, well, it's, it's just too difficult to identify who has caused the harm. Uh, um, and the court was very clear uh, as to saying that each participant must eliminate its own contribution. So it's not a problem if you actually go against a, one particular uh, uh, responsible entity. Um, the court is still not prevented from, le uh, from hearing the case. The other interesting issue concerning evidence also, um, you can see in the, in the next paragraph, um, the court said whether the defendant's argument is true, that there is no casual relationship between CO2 emissions and the increase in the water level in the lake can be determined only on the basis of evidence already taken. It is the Senate's opinion that the case is not ready for judgment without taking evidence as order, and therefore the defendant has not been subject to a violation of, of his constitutional protected right to be heard in court or his right to effective legal protection. So basically the entire case was not dismissed as the respondent wanted, but the court decided to hear evidence. Now, that may take us to the possibility of having a, a possible si a similar approach by an international court such as the International Court of Justice. I'm not going to deal with advisory functions. It's still a possible that there may be um, a request to the court um, on that basis. But I want to go again to the contentious jurisdiction. We have heard a lot from um, um, the contentious jurisdiction of the ICJ before. Uh, perhaps only to highlight um, what the court has said in the recent case it was the first ever order for compensation for environmental harm in a case concerning Nicaragua and Costa Rica. Uh, para paragraph 34 is, is quite interesting. Um, it says in cases of alleged environmental damage, particular issues may arise with respect to the existence of damage and causation. There may be several concurrent causes. That's not going to be a problem in, in, in dealing, for example, with evidence. Um, it also may be that difficulties um, uh, may emerge uh, or the state of science regarding the casual link between the wrongful act and the damage may be uncertain. Again, that's not going to be an issue for the court not to be able, nevertheless, to look into um, issues of compensation. Um, paragraph 35, uh, um, and onwards uh, also deals with valuation of damage. And I believe that that is quite interesting because um, even in the case that there is no, it's not possible to ascertain, uh, to, put a, to put a number uh, or, or scientifically on the loss, um, the court is um, um, somehow stressing a principle that it will be a perversion of fundamental principles of justice to deny all relief to the injured person. It will be enough if the evidence showed the extent of the damages as a matter of just and reasonable inference, although the result be only approximate. And, and also refer to equitable considerations. As we can see, therefore, um, the um, ICJ um, has taken this bold step to actually go uh, on to given um, legal consequences for environmental harm for the first time. Now, uh, Judge Greenwood made a comment some time ago as to how serious, therefore, parties who are litigating cases before the ICJ should take 
um, or when they make assertions as to um, issues of uh, um, harm having taken place because uh, sometimes uh, uh, in the past the court has found that uh, that was not corroborated by facts. So facts are important. I'm going to end up just on a, on a high note uh, um, uh, stressing that the International Tribunal for the Sea is uh, a court that has uh, it's less likely to, to have, um, or oh, it's a smaller, there's a smaller bench. There's, uh, for example, in a, the recent case concerning the Ghana Cote d'Ivoire um, dispute, um, it was a chamber of six people who decided, whereas to find consensus on a, on a bench composed by 16 judges is obviously uh, more challenging. Um, and the, the, the court in that particular case um, asserted very important principles as well. Environment to preserve the marine environment is part of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. And it was uh, applied in, in the context of provisional measures, uh, requesting the parties not to take any actions. Uh, drilling in, in the disputed area had to stop uh, with obvious economic legal consequences, but nevertheless, the, um, I would say that the uh, importance of uh, protecting the environment uh, was overriding. Um, the reason why I made all these brief uh, references to all these possible um, jurisdictions uh, and courts is because I think this is just the beginning. I believe we are just experiencing the beginning of um, seeing to what extent international courts can be useful in the resolution of disputes. And, and we have to work together, lawyers and scientists, because as you have seen, scientists are going to play an important role in giving evidence as experts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another fascinating presentation with an excellent summary um, of um, the relevant areas of the law. Um, so now I'd like to call on Dr. Ursula Tort, um, and who is going to focus on um, enforcement and small states in particular. So you have a choice again of standing or sitting. Thank you very much to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I am going to talk about um, the way in which small states can be affected by the enforcement of arbitral awards, and in particular, in instances where small states are not parties to the dispute, but they are third parties. <coughs> this conference is part of a very highly successful series of conferences organized um, here at Wilmer Hale and there was a previous conference which focused on the integration and dispute resolution in small states. Um, and again, that looked at small states as parties to um, an arbitration and how to level the playing field for small states um, in those disputes. So I'm going to look at how they can be affected when they are third parties and how they can be affected in terms of labor law rights, human rights, and their environmental, uh, their rights under envir environmental law. I'm going to use a recent case and some recent events from the Conoco Phillips and Venezuela case um, to demonstrate the potential concerns that we may have in this field. So just to recap, um, some of the main characteristics of small states I would like to highlight some of these. We've obviously we've already heard some of these themes earlier today. I'd like to highlight vulnerability, volatility, and value of these small states. Vulnerability, of course, stems from their from their small size, the low number of population, small domestic markets, and their reliance on just a few industries, one or two um, sectors. Volatility, what does it mean? I think it's a very important aspect of small states. Uh, what it means is that even if there is just a relatively small uh, impact or change, whether it's economical or environmental, it can trigger a huge impact in a small state. It can send shock waves through the country. And volatility leads to what I would call a magnifying effect. So, um, 
and we'll come back to that later on. And again, value. Let's not forget about the value of the small states. A lot of them, um, small state islands, they host um, valuable natural resources, and also they, um, they are home to, for example, oil refineries, which um, will come up as a relevant factor in the Conoco case. Finally, another point that I would like to make by way of background is that we must not lose sight of global challenges when we discuss the challenges of small states. As it was, not, as, as it was highlighted earlier today, we are all in it together and the global challenges affect small states. And um, these challenges are in fact magnified when we're looking at the small state context. So um, let's move on to the details. Uh, not too much details, but just enough for background of this um, dispute, which I think is a cautionary tale. The Conoco Phillips and Venezuela arbitration, it was an ICC case, which is what I'm, the case that I'm focusing on. Conoco Phillips invested, it is the largest oil exporter in the world, and it made an investment uh, in the mid-90s into Venezuela, where there were certain financial incentives to attract investment. Later on, these uh, incentives were withdrawn. There were tax hikes, and, um, and the Conoco Phillips brought an ICC arbitration on a contractual basis against Venezuela. Um, well, not exactly Venezuela, PDVSA, which is the state-owned oil production um, exploration and exporter of Venezuela. PDVSA is the fifth largest oil exporter in the world. So we can see that there is a battle between giants. We will see how small countries will come in later on. So it concerned two extra heavy crude oil projects in Venezuela. Uh, PDVSA, by the ICC tribunal, was held liable on a contractual basis for expropriation of the investment. And there was a, a recently, well, recently earlier this year, 24th of April 2018, there was an award in favor of Conoco in the amount of um, 2 billion US dollars. The claim originally was first formulated to be $11 billion and it went up to 20 billion. So we are talking about substantial sums of money. Again, by way of background, there's also another um, exit arbitration running parallel to this, parallel to the ICC. That is in the assessment of damages phase. I will not go into that in detail, just for background. So having set out this background of this dispute and where we are, with it, where we were in April, the $2 billion award, let's go now up one level up to the global context of investment treaty arbitration. So although this was an ICC dispute, it, it really concerned um, the state interest and the state, state owned entity. So I would like to bring in the, the current legitimacy crisis of investment treaty arbitration because it's a, it's a challenge that dispute resolution community and um, multinationals and states are facing globally. And again, it has a magnifying effect and the small states are also uh, subject to this challenge. As most of you probably are well aware, there are criticisms leveled against um, investment treaty arbitration based on the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability of arbitrators, their independence, and the fact that um, public budgets are at stake, and therefore th the public has the right for greater transparency and so forth. What I would like to focus on is a, is a particular problem that is perhaps not highlighted enough in, in the literature, and that is the huge amount of damages that tribunals are awarding and have been recently awarding. No doubt this is at least in part a consequence of the fact that claimants are claiming more. In the Conoco case, 11 billion or 20 billion later on. Um, a few examples, Occidental Ecuador exit case in 2012, $2 billion were awarded to Occidental. Later on, there was a partial annulment of this uh, award, and that brought the amount down to roughly about $1 billion. Of course, the very well-known UCOS arbitration, several awards, the combined amount, amount of which was $50 billion US dollars. I think it's roughly about 20, 25% of something like that of, of the budget of Russia. So we're talking really significant sums. And again, the Conoco Venezuela decision by the ICC tribunal, again, 2 billion. That, that, so, so there is an observable trend, 
and there is no sign of reversal in this trend. And we can also see that this is happening across various fora, so ICSID, the PCA, and also ICC tribunals. Why is this a, a, a particularly crucial issue when we're looking at it from a small state perspective? And here I would like to quote, um, it's an article piece by Tai Heng Cheng who wrote this at the time in 2012 where the Occidental Award was published. And discussing the value of the award, he says that this now shows that there is a power to power of investment tribunals to impose damages of over a billion dollars to rectify wrongful acts. This power is nothing short of the ability to radically alter the wealth of shareholders and workers of investor companies, as well as the well-being of citizens and residents of host states. So once again, now we can see that the greater the amount of the award, the greater the extent to which tribunals have a power over the well-being of citizens and residents of host states, which can have labor right impacts, human rights and environmental law rights impacts, as we will shortly see. So let's go back to the Venezuela case and see why does it matter for small states in particular. So two days after the award was issued, ConocoPhillips started a rather um, confident or purposeful or aggressive, one might say, enforcement proceedings in various jurisdictions. So on the 26th of April, there is a petition um, to enforce the award in, in New York District Court, Southern District um, of New York. And also they filed in Hong Kong, Paris, London, and other Caribbean countries, wherever they thought that assets could be located. What we are really focusing on now is that they also filed for enforcement of the ICC award in the so-called ABC Islands. They contain Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, which is how I believe it should be pronounced, but if somebody knows otherwise, please let me know, but I think it's Curaçao, and the island of St. Eustatius. So Aruba and Curaçao, they are autonomous countries which are part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but they have their own parliament and the prime minister and so on and so forth. So they illustrate very well the challenges of small island countries when they get caught up in the, a fight between giants, when their award is sought to be enforced in their territory. So what happened in Curaçao in particular? So in early May, um, 4th of May, according to reports, the, the, the local court um, issued an order which uh, permitted the attachment of certain oil products on ships and bank deposits belonging to the PDV um, SA. And um, so there were oil um, uh, consignments on ships around the Caribbean, around the shore, which were then supposed to be um, uh, shipped further on around the world. And they were attached, so they couldn't export anymore. Also, there's the Isla refinery on Curaçao, which obviously um, provides jobs for a, a considerable number of the, the population there. And the estimated total of seizure, according to reports, was roughly around 600 million. So what was the statement by ConocoPhillips in connection with this enforcement? They said that what they're doing is they're pursuing enforcement and financial recovery for their award to the full extent of the law. That's their perspective. Let's see the perspective of the former prime minister of Curaçao, who addressed an open letter to Conoco, quoting a few things. So, in their view, Conoco has no regard whatsoever for the consequences these actions may have on the already fragile economies of these islands, of the ABC islands. So, already fragile economies. We can see the vulnerability here that we mentioned at the beginning. Conoco sees fit to put thousands of jobs in the small, fragile economy and labor market at risk. Oh, sorry, I, I, yeah, I jumped the important part. So what they are doing is choking some of the largest flows of cash in a small econ economy, inadvertently uh, choking the entire economy. So here we see the volatility, that magnifying effect. So just by seizing those oil products there, which might not be such a huge thing for a large country, in a small country, it can choke the entire economy. It can have a devastated effect. People can lose their job. 
So Caribbean nationals will have to move or even migrate to find a new job. It can lead to migration. It can raise potential human rights issues. And, and the former prime minister finishes off by saying, shame on you, Konoko, for the anguish you have poured in the hearts and homes of Dutch Caribbean families. You're acting like a bull that is out to destroy our economies without regard. Leave us in the Dutch Caribbean alone. So what we see here is a, is a very strong clash between the views of, of, of uh, Konoko, which is a corporate giant, and the views of a small island country. Now let's go back again to the global context. So what was the impact of these seizures globally? Um, there is a, is a map, I'm not so sure how much you can actually see, but it's actually showing that from the Isla refinery in Curacao, um, they ship the oil to South America, back to Central America, Europe, but also all the way to the Far East and India and Africa. So what happened is, due to the seizures, the export, the, the, avail the globally available oil export, export has dropped and it um, was leading to, or they were experts who were uh, forecasting that it could lead to rising oil prices. So that's the global impact. And also if we take into account that at the time there were US sanctions on Iran leading to a drop in Iran's oil production, which again reduced the available oil, pushing the oil prices even further up. And uh, because of the enforcement, PDVSA was actually crumbling. And uh, it, is, it is on the verge of collapse at the moment, which will further push oil production down, leading potentially to further rise in global oil prices. So again, we can see that the challenge on the global scale is rise in oil prices. And on a small state perspective, from that perspective, it can have a potentially devastating effect on the whole economy. And again, let's recall the words that were made in connection with Occidental Ecuador, that tribunals, by awarding such huge damages, have the power to affect the well-being of citizens and residents of host states. We can now add to that that they can even impact their whole entire economy if what we're talking about is a small state. And also, this small state wasn't a host state and wasn't party to the dispute or the arbitration. It was a bystander, so to speak. And what does that leave us with? I think it leaves us with more questions than answers. And uh, I think the question to ask is what we've been asking in the previous conferences, which is how to level the playing field. How do we um, improve the, um, the, the capabilities of small states? And what can we do? So first of all, there are some doubts. Well, Konoko said what they're doing is what they're just enforcing to the full extent of the law. Um, but we have to wonder whether it, this was about applying pressure for a political agreement, which is um, what happened is exactly that. Just on the 20th of August 2018, there was a declaration that there was a political agreement between the parties that um, payment will be made. Meanwhile, the, um, the local courts have actually lifted the attachments even, even before that date. So one of the things that we can do, I think, is to, to raise awareness of these issues, that when tribunals are ruling on um, these kind of disputes and awarding the, the, the award, is there any way for us to get them to think about these issues, what may happen to small states further down the line? How can small states predict that further down the line they may be affected? Um, can they perhaps participate as amicus curiae in the proceedings if the rules allow? And of course, um, refusal of enforcement locally of the award on public policy grounds under the New York Convention is also uh, one possible way of protection of small states and increasing the capabilities of local lawyers and judges. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ursula.